and I've noticed this year mm-hmm. that the anxiety has just been off the chart, but right. I've noticed it with almost everybody I know. So, right. you know, right. you know, I don't want to say it's just the kids. Sure. Uh, but yeah, they, um, you know, when we talk about, um, when we talk about the MFA and, and what, you know, it's something I've, I've thought a lot about because I didn't get an MFA when I was at that age where you, you do those sorts of things. I actually got, got my MBA at, at that point, which is, you know, not that many art teachers out there with MBAs. That's true. You know? And so, but you're but, diversified and that helps. Exactly. Well, yeah. Am I, I, you know, I like to think that I have a really interesting worldview, right? You know, when, you know, you know, when you're, uh, you know, when you're teaching art history and, and art and you have an MBA and, you know, you have, you know, I have so many inputs that have gone on in my head. I like to think that I see the world in a little bit different way. And now it's just a matter of, you know, how do I, you know, put that, put that down in a way that, uh, that my work reflects that. But, you know, I, I've tried to do the analysis of, you know, Hey, um, you know, is it, you know, is it, what is the return on investment at this point in getting an MFA? And I look at the prospects and how higher education, higher education is changing. Not only is it getting more and more expensive, uh, but they're, you know, they are trying to maximize their profits the most, uh, the best way they can. A lot of endowments, you know, are huge, but they're earmarked for specific programs or specific things. Yes. And so, you know, under those constraints, um, the, the universities, um, you know, prefer to hire adjunct faculty rather than tenured faculty. And so, you well, know, it's a trend that's mirrored in, in industrialized America right. is, you know, it, it's the Walmart syndrome, right? P- keep people just under full time and you don't have to pay insurance. There are all right. sorts of things you don't have to pay. And it, it, it's a crime that, that universities are doing this. It's an absolute crime. You're, you are, you are fracturing these students education you are are turning very educated faculty into slave labor. Right. Um, there's there's just no upside to it. And if the upside's the bottom line, well, then you've got your priorities screwed up right. enormously. And so I feel like you know a certain proportion of folks that are motivated to get their MFA are thinking that tenured teaching is their end goal, and. I, you know, I think if we look at the statistics, you know, um, you know, the, the number of MFAs that are being churned out every year versus the number of tenure positions just dwindling down and down. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to have a plague right, to clear up enough <laughs> tenured positions that could right. be replaceable and it's, it, it's not going right. to happen. And so at the end of the day, I ask myself, you know, would that, would I rather have my situation given my level of income and, you know, job satisfaction and, and, uh, what all is entailed in my job or would I rather be an adjunct, you know, kind of bouncing from school to school being an adjunct? It, that's an easy answer for me. I'd, I'd rather, uh, I'd rather be doing what I'm doing. Well, in your classroom, that's where everything's happening to me that matters. Right. Uh, literally, uh, secondary education in the visual arts, I think, is at a high point right now, mm-hmm. while higher education in the visual arts is at a low point. Right. So pat yourself on the back. <laughs> well, I can I pat you on the back. You know, I mean, you're, I mean, you've, um, I mean, you're, again, you, you're in a great district doing, you know, um, high achieve. I, you know, I don't know how many people, uh, so you're in Plano ISD, you're yes. in Plano West. Um, you know, uh, historically Plano ISD is one of the <clears throat> highest achieving districts, uh, in the nation, much less Texas, Plano West, one of the, uh, probably the highest achieving, you know, within Plano ISD. Um, you know, my, uh, my wife, uh, before we moved to South Lake, uh, she taught at Jasper, and, oh yes, uh, okay. all right. So those that uh, nine and ten level that feeds into to Plano West, and so I have a really good uh, understanding of the the type of student 
that, that comes through your program. And they, um, you know, I would imagine that, you know, uh, that there, how many, my impression of the kids in, in, uh, at Plano West, a lot of them are, are high achieving. It's, it's ultra competitive because they're all trying to, to get to the same place. They're all trying to get to MIT. They're all trying to get to Harvard. They're all trying to get to Stanford. Right. Um, but you know, not, uh, do you have, uh, do you have some of those, um, you know, engineering, high achieving kids coming through, or do you, do you have a lot of the kids that, you know, aren't in that box and, you know, they don't feel like they're, you know, they're that same high achieving kid and you're, you're helping them find, uh, their identity that has just as much value as, you know, or is it, or is it both? The answer is yes, both. Uh, very much so. Uh, we absolutely have a huge contingency of those very goal oriented, focus oriented. They want to be at the top art school in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, and they all have a different opinion of what the top art school in the country is. So, uh, as I do. Right. So, um, but very goal oriented, but you know, the, the demographics of Plano West are like an hourglass. Uh, Mm -hmm. the the top end is what you would expect to be the top end. It's that, um, very well off uh section of of west plano uh the middle section is is our narrowest section we actually serve the largest multi-family uh lower income housing of any of the plano senior highs wow and so you have a very very diverse economically uh body of students and uh we draw from all of that equally and the success is equal up and down uh, because the culture of success at Plano West is something that's really hard to describe to someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's a magical culture and, and, and it is a culture in, in most of Plano and to try to explain how it works is almost like trying to explain how air works. Um, sure. it, it just does. Right. Um, we have a new superintendent that we just brought up from, you know, within the district that we're all excited about that understands the Plano way. Right. Um, but at West in particular, uh, there is this strive for excellence, um, with, I would say 80% of the student body, uh, that they want to succeed and they want to do well. And, um, you know, as a result, there's a very high anxiety level there too. Because, you know, 80% 80 percent of the kids can't be in the top 10 percent of the class oh no 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 um but you know that that whole the whole top 10 percent grade point thing is doing a lot of damage especially mm-hmm. you know with the texas state schools now uh, mm-hmm. what is it to get uh, in i think uh it's I not think, even well, top 10 percent what well, like at ut i think now automatic admission is all the way to seven percent and, uh, but you know, schools, schools have to report, you know, there, there's like this discussion that, you know, that, uh, the schools should be looking at, um, the quality of an application, regardless of what class rank is. And, but schools are continuing to have to report the cl- uh, class rank because the legislature says, Yes. They have to report the class rank. And the reason they have to report the class rank is because they, in the state schools, need to be able to figure out this automatic admission. Uh, but some districts are, are saying, okay, we are only going to report the top, you know, only what's required. We will only report who the top 10% in a class is. And then we're, you know, beyond that, we're not going to disclose a rank. Absolutely. A lot of, a lot of the districts have, have gone to that. And so method. it's up to you to assume whether this person is at, in the 11th percentile or the 95th percentile. Look at the quality you know, of their, of their scores, what their you know, activities are, their grade point. What, wh- how would you consider this person's application, you know, regardless? And so I, at the end of the day, it would probably be a greater service if if they just you know didn't have that requirement and we didn't have class ranks um 
you know, for, you're, ta- for, you're talking about redesigning a vastly, right. I mean, that's it's all very intricate bureaucratic <laughs> system, and there are always simple answers to it. But you know, right. one thing affects everything else. Um, it's just in terms of higher education, we we have a, as a nation have to have some hard conversations about getting it back into the affordable range, getting it mm-hmm. back into to where everybody has a chance of of going, even if they choose not to, you know, right. we've demonized trade schools, but you know, there are people that go to trade schools and come out as plumbers and make absolutely fantastic livings right. and they'll always be in demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are people that come out with MBAs that live at their parents' house. Right. Uh, because you know, there are a lot of people with MBAs. Right. Um, one of the cool things about kids majoring in visual arts is when you have to stand out somehow in this vast field of applicants to a university, mm-hmm. a portfolio can go a long way. Right. When your grades don't show what you're able to do, the quality uh, of that portfolio shows what you're capable of doing. You're right. I uh, I share uh, at my open house every year. I share uh, a New York Times article with with parents that uh, discusses how um, Ivy League admissions officers. Um, admittedly uh, talk about how they love seeing uh, these AP portfolios on the applications and as part of the material because it it's a course that you know it's obvious that someone's not just trying to pad their their high school resume with some random AP offering they know that it's it's highly rigorous and takes a, a lot of um, a lot of commitment but it also, um, you know, shows kind of a, a depth of character and, um, you know, uh, an expanded worldview that, you know, that they that they find attractive. And it, I think you're right. It, it allows them the opportunity to to stand out from from other applicants. It does. And, and going back to what we were talking about with adjunct faculty, um, you know, adjunct faculty are rated by the students every year or every semester. And that goes in part as to whether they'll be hired again. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they're afraid, you know, to be too aggressive in in their criticism. And my students have noticed that a lot. Um, I I will pat myself on the back in terms that we do very rigorous college-level critiques Mm -hmm. in my class. And um, we, um, I teach the kids how to, to, to critique and to accept criticism. And to talk on a on a, a very mature level about work, and they will come back after being at school uh, for the first semester and say we never get the critiques that we got at Plano West. Wow. That the critiques at at university level are sort of like, oh, this looks great, everything looks great, everything's well, those, wonderful. Those were my college level critiques. My, oh, mine were, were horrible. <laughs> they, my, mine were, but you know, and but. My critiques are also fun. I mean, my kids right. want me to get a T-shirt that says "brutally honest" right. on it. Um, but I think giving the kids the skills at those age, at that age, um, to accept criticism, whether you pursue a career in the visual right. arts or not, is is invaluable experience. Yeah, we we try to we try to maintain that. So I uh, I try to to uh, always try to keep it uh, keep the criticism inside the the compliment sandwich right mm-hmm. you know start with something positive end with something positive but try to be br- brutally honest in the middle and i mean it's it's really it's uh it's tricky because you know there is uh, there are studies that show that part of uh, high creativity is um is not that to nurture creativity um there's a there's a point where negative feedback can really be crushing yes right absolutely and you know i especially with our student body we have a lot of kids that come in that have received high praise for everything they've done right. their entire artistic career so they have the in- inability to look at their work critically um, every mark they make is the right mark to them. And uh, those are hard kids to get through. And sometimes you do have to be brutally honest with them. Um, I'm not saying you have to crush them to bring them up again. Right. But, you know, the, there there has to be some frank talking. And a, a lot of it's done in my class with humor. Right. So I'm not coming straight at them with the surgical scalpel. You know, I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm trying to 